Hello, and welcome to Product Momentum, where we hope to entertain, educate, and celebrate the amazing product people who are helping to shape your community's way ahead. My name is Paul Gable, and I'm the Director of Product Innovation at ITX. Along with my co-host, Sean Flaherty, and our amazing production team and occasional guest host, we record and release a conversation with a product thought leader, writer, speaker, or maker who has something to share with the community every two weeks. Well, we are fortunate to be joined by Ben Karsich and Aaron Smith of Building Better Games today. We covered a lot of ground. There's really no good way to introduce the range of topics that we got into from holistic leadership to the state of the gaming industry, what product management can bring to gaming and vice versa, and just a really fresh take on how to build things that matter to people. I can't think of a more fun time that I've had recording this podcast, so let's get after it. Well, hello and welcome to the pod. Today, I am really excited to introduce Ben Karsich and Aaron Smith of Building Better Games. Over the last decade, they've led 100-person teams to build multi-million dollar products with some of the largest audiences in the world. During that time, they've built leadership standards, team structure, strategy, an S-tier hiring approach for top-tier talent. And then in 2019, they moved over to see what they could do to help leaders across the industry struggling with minimal support. And they wanted to share that secret sauce full time. That's what got them excited and energized. And now they run a boutique advisory firm for leaders and executives in games and create content for line leaders to level up across the industry. When they're not advising studios, they build products. They mentor game producers and run top games industry podcasts. They write a biweekly newsletter for industry leaders, and they're here to join us today for a great conversation. I'm going to pass it to you two to introduce yourselves a little bit more, starting alphabetically with Aaron. You want to share a bit about where you come from and what, what what's inspiring you today? Yeah, I'm without equal in the first name, alphabetized. Yeah, so I went to film school, realized very quickly doing some production work in the film industry that I hated that. It was not my tribe. So I fell back on the thing my parents told me was not a legitimate career path, which was joining the video games industry. And I joined this tiny little company called Riot Games as an intern, running sandwiches and things like that at a time where all I knew was that they were making a game kind of like Dota with a really vibrant color scheme. And yeah, the rest is history. I was there for over 10 years, started as an intern, left as essentially a director, and then got into the consulting biz with, with Ben. So we can take all the stuff we've learned and try to help other people who are struggling with it like we did. Awesome. Ben, tell us a bit about yourself. My background, technically I got a computer and systems engineering degree, never used it. Then I went into the military, became a combat arms officer, and fortunately never used that either. Ended up doing mostly logistics and staff work, spent a year overseas, came back. Similar to Aaron, not my tribe. Plenty of things are awesome about the military, but it just wasn't where I, I fit in. So left, sent off some Hail Mary resumes and somehow got a response from this game I was playing called League of Legends. The company was Riot and a few... I think a couple months later, I ended up starting working there. I had no idea what I was doing. But went from that to trying to figure out what I was doing to over time, actually figuring out, I think, sort of some of the things that I'm supposed to do. And eventually realized that I enjoyed helping people level up as leaders and be better producers. The growth and improvement aspect meant a lot more to me even than making games, although I, I love that too. And so left to join up with Aaron, and now we try to do that. That's awesome. And full disclosure, Ben, you and I have actually raided together in some video game experiences yep. and and gone to opening nights of Star Wars. <laughs> so I, I'm wow. I'm, that was I'm a, yep. Yep. I'm a pre, I'm appreciative to to get a chance to to get on the record professionally with you. In only 25 minutes, don't don't mention the word Star Wars again, or Aaron and I will just like it'll that. Well, that's all we'll talk about. Yeah, blow out your whole podcast here. N noted. <laughs> well, I do want to take a turn into where you were going just a minute ago and talk at a high level just about your experience with games and and why games and specifically inspired by a post that Aaron shared on LinkedIn pretty recently. Just from a personal perspective, what's a unique impact that games have had on each of you? And I'd love to hear from you both on that question. Oh, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. For me, I had a lot of trouble when I was in school. I didn't, I, I didn't have social, great social skills. I didn't know how to connect with the other kids. I felt very isolated. Sometimes things were really tough at home. And so I felt like I, I just didn't have the ability to connect. 
and it and it brought on a lot of really tough feelings growing up in in that kind of space and you know i got access to the internet and i always found that in a positive way the anonymity was an opportunity to start fresh like no one knew me no one knew that i wasn't the cool kid at school it was just a fresh conversation and it allowed me to experiment and like try on new faces and kind of ha have a conversation with myself about who i wanted to be and that led to playing MMOs and meeting a bunch of people around the world and finding my stride as a human and as a leader, I think, in that space, not knowing that that was something I could be or that I would ever be. And I think that that provided a sort of an incubator for me to completely change who I am and who I wanted to be. And that was, I, I look back on that opportunity and, and feel so grateful that video games provided me with that. I mean, I still hang out with those guys and girls to this day as well. They've had a, just such an impactful, played such an impactful role in my life. And I think that for me, video games are extremely personal because of that. I never bought into the whole like, well, they rot your brain out and you should not play more than two hours a week and you should focus your on more better pursuits like going outside and playing basket or whatever it is. I'm like, this is really important stuff. And, it, and it's really, really positive for so many people. I really believe that. And I, I feel like it's important work. And I think that that's, for me, the, the impact of it all. I love that connection. Ben, what about you? What, what do you what I've, I've, got, do I've got nothing that matches that, but I'll do my best. So for me, when I think about the impact, one of them was, I was a Boy Scout, Aaron was as well. And I then went into the military. But when I think of like, formative young leadership experiences they came in games in hosting rooms in rogue spear or in like raid leading you know i was a main tank raid lead in early wow and burning crusade and some of that time period and bringing a group of people together with disparate interests dis disparate skill levels and you know trying to figure out how we can all collectively not stand in the fire for the 10 minutes it's going to take us to bring this down was a heck of a an experience, a, a, a deep dive into a leadership at a practical level with people who had, I wasn't paying them to be there. They didn't have to do this. They were there by choice. And I was leading them and they were following me by choice. And at any time they could pitch a fit and leave and quit. And like, you know, and that happened, right? And what do you do? And how do you respond to that? And, you know, and there's this, there's all this stuff that you accept as responsibility when you go into that, but you don't view it as a burden because you're happy to be there with that group of people. So that's, that's one side of it. And I think there was this huge like leadership piece that, that video games taught. And then another was up until recently, I would say like one of the best things I was good at, you know, one of the things I was most good at in life was Halo 2. And I don't know, you know, for me, I'm actually proud of that for many people, maybe not, but like for me, I'm proud of that. It took a lot of work and a lot of effort. I wasn't a competitive, like I didn't, you know, go to MLGs or anything like that, but I, I played it at a pretty high level. You know, I played with my brother. We were, we were both quite proficient and just the learning of how do you get better at something? How do you interact with a team and how do you stay focused on the goal of the group, not the individual goal? A lot of that stuff came up for me when I, when I was playing FPSs and I still enjoy FPSs to this day, even though not nearly as good at them. So, so yeah, it's, but it's been, I think those are two things that come to mind for me. There's like so many others, right. That we could go into individual experiences, yeah. but, but I think those are the big two. I love it. And I can personally attest the first time I cleared the King's Fall raid in the Destiny game, you were my Sherpa. So you absolutely were a great leader in, in that experience. And that's actually one of the one, one of the times that I would look back on as like, I had no idea what, is getting, what I was getting into. I think that might've been my first Destiny raid was, was with you. Oh, that was a good one. That was a good yeah. one. So I want to shift gears. I could talk about that all day. So I'm going to refrain from the temptation. Talk a bit about you now on the other side of the microphone being guests where you're usually spending time hosting a fantastic podcast called Building Better Games. You emphasize leadership and game development. And you've already alluded to several aspects that I want to get into, but un unpacking a little bit more specifically, you use the phrase holistic leadership a lot in your, in your speaking. And, and I'm curious, what does that mean for each of you? What does holistic leadership mean? And why do you find it so crucial? This is really, you know, one of the core value propositions of your firm. What is leadership to you? Yeah, it's, it, this is funny because like when we first started using the term holistic, my, the thought where my brain went was like holistic doctors, you know, those guys that like half the population <laughs> doesn't trust and think are like uneducated quacks. 
the idea of holistic is to treat the entire body, right? It's like, hey, if you're suffering physically, it might be really good for you to think about your diet. It might be really good for you to think about going to therapy. It might be really good for you to try maybe something off the beaten path when it comes to medicine, if you have a particularly unique circumstance. Like, I think for us, when we think about holistic leadership, the idea of it going in that Ben and I were seeing was, and we, we actually, in the podcast where we break it down, we talked about the idea of a ship and a crew on a ship and a bunch of people running around on the top deck, just doing all the things like making sure the cannons are loaded, making sure the sails are being adjusted and steering wheel, like all the stuff that we think about when we think about running projects and we think about building products. And a lot of the times there's a leak at the bottom deck and the ship is actually in the process of sinking. It's just no one's thinking about what's going on down there until it's too late. And it's like, and you're sitting here and you're like loading up cannons while the ship is like taking on water. Yeah. And the analogy was so valuable to us because we realized that in our careers, a lot of times the teams and companies we worked for felt like that, where it was like the surface level was all anyone was talking about. It's like, are the spreadsheets filled out? And is the process good? And did the people go to the meetings at the right time? And did this, and then we, we talked about it. And because we talked about it, obviously it's good. Never mind that we didn't make any decisions or we didn't really change anything. You know, never mind that everybody knows that the four biggest risks that they've been raising flags about for the last six months, we've all ignored and are just pretending aren't going to be there and blow up the project three months from now. These are the kinds of things that we go, leaders need to internalize responsibility for that. And to be a holistic leader, it's like we've, we've broken it down to the top deck, which is process, which is. We don't talk about, not because it's not important, but because most people already know it all. And then the next level down, which is the product, which we talk about a lot more, but is still one of the more talked about things. And then the, the lowest level is the culture. It's like, how are people actually behaving? So it's like, if you have a meeting every day where no one makes any decisions based off of it, and all they do is just exchange information, that's a cultural thing. There's a, there's a behavior there, a standard of behavior that's being set somewhere. Leaders, you have to care about that. That needs to be where you start the conversation. That's what holistic leadership means. Like start at the most foundational level and work your way up. Don't start at the most surface level and work your way down because by the time you think about it, your ship has sunk. So that's the idea. And that's what we're trying to teach leaders to do. Amazing metaphor. No holes below the waterline, right? Yeah, right. The thing I would add is the idea of leadership is something that we've defined as influencing others towards a goal. And I, it came out of like looking at a ton of different definitions and going, what are the commonalities around? Because like everybody's got a different definition of leadership. And some of them, I think someone was like, a leader is a person with a non-anxious presence. And I'm like, what? Like, and I see stuff like that. I see all the, and it's like, what actually is this? What are we talking about here? And it was influencing others towards a goal that was sort of the summation, a very simple summation of it. And that thing, when we're talking about culture, leaders, whether they know it or not, are influencing culture. The question is, do they know what they're influencing it towards? And a huge part of our call towards what Aaron so eloquently described as holistic leadership is to say, you need to be thinking about how what you're doing, the questions you're asking, the, the way you're talking to people, collaborating, not collaborating, what meetings you show up to, what you don't show up to, the decisions you choose to make and let others make, all of that is setting cultural norms across your ship, your organization. And are you conscious of that or is that just happening? Because one of the things we say about culture is if you don't think about culture, it's not that you don't have one. It's just one you probably didn't want. <laughs> it's highly unlikely, right? And so instead thinking about how are you influencing culture? How are you influencing the product, the vision, how are you influencing the process? All of these things like feed into each other. But that culture layer is the one that everybody tends to ignore. And it's the most key to the long-term success of your organization. Yeah. Well, I, I think you're, you're teasing where I wanted to go next, which is we look around the gaming industry specifically, you know, as of the, the time of this recording this week, we, we heard another round of bad news and, yeah. you know, layoffs, squeeze more margins, profit rather than growth focus. Yeah. shareholder fatigue, the bloom is off the rose in this era of growth at all costs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as we're, as we're looking around, you know, the SaaS companies, digital companies who've gone through digital transformations, the kind of feeling that we, we look around for is, you know, we hear a lot of talk of ROI and it, there's just a lot that many people are, 
you know, generally gloomy about in the tech industry writ large. Yeah. What are you optimistic about with so much keeping so many up at night? I mean, I'm optimistic that like there's two major trends. One of them is just raw growth. Like the industry is still growing in percentage terms by a significant amount. Like Ben and I were just talking last week about the fact that there's always the perception and then there's the analytical reality. And the analytical reality, if you look at it by the numbers, is that like, and I don't want to trivialize how people feel about what's happening right now because it feels very traumatic. Like a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are losing their jobs. These are real people, has a real impact. But if you look at it in percentage terms, like in raw actual per capita terms, it's very, the impact is quite small actually compared to the size of the industry. And, and the very, I think, aggressively positive outlook of our industry. It wasn't too long ago where we were talking about the idea of surpassing the, films in this, the film industry as the biggest entertainment industry on earth. And we are over double the size of it now in like less than a decade. So it's like, this is the, this is the, the hope of our industry and the promise of our industry from a, in pure economic terms. So like, I, I think it's, it's going great, honestly. Like there are going to be way more jobs for people doing what we do 10 years from now than there are today. Now that, again, that doesn't take away from the pain that's being felt today. And, you know, Ben and I were talking about this. We were worried about this when COVID first started and it yeah. was like, how many jobs can I get? And I'm quiet quitting. And like, my boss is an asshole. And like, you know, all this stuff that was sort of popular on social media at the time, it was like the workers strike back kind of like I get to work at home and you're not the boss of me and I can do whatever I want and you need me because I'm a decent engineer. This is the the world we lived in and Ben and I are like, oh God, the, the when the pendulum swings back, it's going to be nasty. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it has to swing back, not because it was wrong or bad for that to happen. It was actually kind of nice to see the workers stick it to the man a little bit. You're like, how long has it been since that happened? You know, but like now it's swinging back and you can tell, like, for example, that some of these games companies are like, everyone's laying off now. We can just sort of say that we're doing some cost cutting measures when in reality, we're just getting rid of the 10% of people who annoyed us the most or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not, I, I think it's horrible, but like, you know, I'm sure some of them have been waiting for an opportunity to cull the wheat or, or like separate the wheat from the chaff or whatever it is that they think that they're doing, right? Yeah. And justify their behavior. And it's just kind of the ebb and flow of economics. You have to sort of like put, take it in stride to a degree. I mean, like for us, it's been tough too. So like, I don't want anyone to think that we've been immune to this. Like the cons being a consultant has been really difficult the last yeah. 18 months. We've seen some of our, our close peers wash out and really struggle. So yeah, it is a tough environment right now. And I don't blame anybody for feeling defeated at yeah. the moment. So. I'm going to take a weird, pessimistic, optimistic approach to answering this because I think, yeah, Aaron Aaron nailed it on like the the big stuff. I have always seen back in the military and today in games and and there there are so many opportunities to do things better. And I think you can look at that through like this frustrated, cynical, bitter, like there's a bunch of problems and oh man, everything sucks, right? Like these are just the problems and it's part of it. And I don't, I get it. Like I've been there and actually a lot of times when I was in um, less functional units in the military, that was the vibe it was just like, oh man, okay, how long till I can get out of this role into a different role or, you know, the reality though, is that that down means that there's opportunity. And I think in games, especially and in game dev, we are creative individuals. I mean, tech generally. And we're looking for ways to do this better. And yeah, there's going to be bumps and it's going to struggle. And we're going to argue about what agile means or what, you know, all this different stuff is. And should we use this framework and how many times do we meet in a day and all the details. But there's massive opportunity. There's massive opportunity to be far more efficient, far more focused on what matters, far more effective at delivering things that our audiences, be they players or users of an app or whatever it is that they need. And so for me, like, that's why I'm optimistic. And there's also, and, you know, another controversial take from us, AI is out there now. It's going to change the world in ways we don't understand, in ways we can't foresee. And that's kind of exciting, actually. And again, you can look at that through like the negative, like, oh, no, who's going to lose a job? But the historical tendency of new technology arriving is always more jobs later, not fewer. And so I view it as like, they're, yep, it's going to be disruptive. But it's kind of, I think it's going to be disruptive in a way that actually enables us to make more amazing things in the broad broad tech space and especially in game dev. 
Great, great answers both. I really appreciate where you went with that. And it, you both spoke to pieces of my experiences that ring very true. And without adding too much color commentary live here, I'll, I'll just say thank you both for those responses. Absolutely gold. The, um, the, the next question that I have for you is taking me back shameless plug to the episode of building better games that I was a guest <laughs> where I actually learned in speaking and prepping for that with you that if I recall correctly, most studios don't have a person in a role called product manager, which was a mm -hmm. surprise mm -hmm. to me because yeah. I, I see games as, you know, software, very sophisticated software, but software. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I think software and product managers are, you know, peanut butter and jelly. So, we, you know, the closest analog being this function called producers, which is not exactly the same thing. So in, in a short, maybe summary of some of the things that we chatted about over there, and we'll link to the full episode in the show notes. What are some of the things that you think product management might be able to benefit the gaming industry for, you know, and, and vice versa for those product managers who are learning that software like games can get built without a product manager? What does that say about us as product managers that these AAA games can be released with, you know, with no one at the traditional product management helm? Where does where does your mind go when you when you think about that idea of this role of product management and what it might add to the gaming industry if it were taken on as a, as a more, you know, chunk of the team in a role. Gosh, there's so many ways. Um, I, f I feel like I'm sort of like, I'm going to take like a speculative stance here. I've thought a lot about this, about like why it is the way that it is. One of the things I feel like that puts enterprise ahead of games is the sort of live nature of a lot of the most emergent technologies in the enterprise space over the last like 20 years. So it's like, I think of a company like Amazon or Google that where their premier technologies are, are very live and continuously evergreen environments in which technology exists and people interact with them every day. And the technology continues to evolve over years or even decades. That aspect of games is actually relatively new. And I think though that, I think that transition actually stimulates a lot of conversation about hey, wouldn't it be great to have a person whose sole job it is to think about what's the next most valuable thing we could do, keep in touch with our customers constantly, and then help the team understand that and contextualize that and internalize responsibility for that, and then always make sure that we're focusing on the most important thing. Like if I were to just like drastically oversimplify what that role is, the product management role, like that's the way I think about it. And I'm like, and I, it just, that, role to me just gushes with value, like in that environment. Like it's like, if that person's really, really, really good at their job, like your company can be good almost with that only. Ben and I are constantly saying that it's better to have a team that works 20% as fast. If that person is picking all the right things, you're still going to get there faster than the team who runs five times as fast, but they pick a lot of bad things yeah, or a lot of suboptimal things. And so when I think about games, we've been building box products for so many years. And so I think we've got in our own heads that like the idea is that by the time you really start building the thing, you should pretty much already know what's important or you should pretty much already know what you're building. And so I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the studios that have dabbled more in product management are the ones that are running more like live service-esque or like continuously evolving products like Riot, for example right? Like it makes sense to me in that context. I also think we have a lot of entertainment industry tradition that binds us into the role of producer as like this sort of logistician that like makes sure the actors are in the right place and make sure the spreadsheets are there. And do we have all our contracts signed? And sadly, I still think like too much of what we do is like takes on that form and color. And I think that we are, I think that there's a lot of people in our industry who are still like dead set on that approach. And so they value the tactician leader, the one that like is crossing all the T's and dotting the I's and making sure everything's perfectly organized. Ben made this lovely LinkedIn post a couple months back about like, why the hell do we still treat this like we're building chairs in a factory? And I think that that just says everything. Like when you're building chairs, you need a line manager on the floor, making sure everybody's showing up to work on time and stuff. You don't need somebody that's like, you know, what's the next most important thing to work on? It's just like build the damn chair, like screw in and, the leg in the right place, you know? And like, to add to the metaphor, you also <laughs> don't want creativity. You want yeah. everybody making exactly. the same yeah. wrong, yeah. the same. Exactly. Yeah, 
So yeah, yeah, and it's it's very to your point, very counterintuitive. And I feel like a lot of people from outside the industry look in and they're like, "What? Why? How do you guys manage this?" And I think the truth is that we actually don't manage it super well. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think there's there's immense waste in game dev, and it's yeah. being called out more and more as yeah. costs go up, as the scale of products go up. You know, you could find one of those old things where it's like, this is a six polygon model. This is a, you know, 60 poly. This is a 600. And then you get to the point where we're at and it's like, wait a minute, there's not that much difference between 6,000 and 60,000 or 60,000 and 6 million, right? Oh, there's a difference. Um, it's called you loading shaders for the first 10 minutes after you launch the game and just sitting there. Exactly. Oh, and, up. But I, I will say, I think the reason <laughs> that I, I think there's two things. One, Aaron pointed to the producer role got, I think, grafted in from other entertainment spaces, yeah. right? Movies and that sort of thing. And so there was an inheriting of that. The other one is we had people who were in charge of the gameplay and the player experience to some extent, and they were designers. Mm -hmm. And game designers are phenomenal. And Aaron and I have worked with amazing game designers. One of the things that's fascinating is I've, I've worked with game designers who can also be product managers, but it's certainly made me realize these are not the same thing. A game designer is an implementer and whether that's at a systems level or a very tactical level, they're thinking about that as like, okay, what's the player going to do? How is this going to relate? What's going to be the compelling experience here? But they're thinking about that in a very nuts and bolts way. And I'm not saying they can't go broader, but that tends to be where they almost have to live because they're talking with engineers and they're talking with QA and they're figuring all that out. And a product manager is there going like, what if we went into a completely different space? What if we didn't do this at all? What if we just didn't have that whole system? How would we still meet this player experience? Now, again, some designers do that. And I think there is a lot of overlap between the design role and the product management role. And I think that's why games for so long have survived in the absence of product managers really being a, a known thing and an understood thing. And why when they've attempted to come in, a lot of times, you know, devs are almost like, well, what in the world is your job? Like, we've got designers. They tell us what to do. They tell us what's important. They're in charge of the experience of the player and the gameplay, right? Aren't those the same thing? It's like, no, they're, they're not. There's a distinction there. And by um, the way, I I would I agree, and I would say if you made a three circle Venn diagram of sort of creative director, which is sort of like the supreme designer in the traditional model, you had producer, and then you had product manager. I would say that the lion's share of the role and the important parts of the role of what I would view as product manager is not generally covered by either of those other two roles. And to me, that's actually the elephant in the room because again, what I love about Ben, like I imagine the designer like painting the world and just being like, this is the world we need to create. This is the world that's compelling from a player standpoint. There's something that the product owner does when they're really good, which is they come in and they say, I see that you used eight colors on this canvas. If I said you could only use four, which four would you cut out? That question, that kind of question, let's say we broke this down into like the first five things and the last five things. What are the first five things that if we could only do those would create a compelling experience? And if, these are the questions that we don't ask. And that gap is is a critical gap, I think, yeah. in our industry. And I think it, the more creative and the more complex the stuff gets, the more we need it. Well, and and I think the more we, unfortunately, intuitively, because the counterintuitive answer is everything Aaron just said, the intuitive answer is we'll bring in the producers and have them make everything more efficient so we can just do it all. Mm-hmm. And it's this misunderstanding of the producer as the logistician of like a project manager, right? Like, did we get it all done? Did we get it all done fast? It's like, yeah, but did you need to get it done? And I can't tell you how many times Aaron and I have gone into work with a company on a consulting gig or even at Riot. And it was like, what are we doing? And they're like, we're doing all this stuff. Look at all this stuff we're doing. And we're like, why is it valuable? And Aaron and I aren't product guys, but we're, we can ask that question. And it's like, well, because it's in the backlog, right? Because it's in on the plan, because somebody at some point in the past said, this is what we need to do. And it's like, okay, how does it relate to the experience we're trying to create, right? right. And again, these are, these are product management questions, right? And I'm not a product manager, but they're, who's going to ask them? Right. And I think that's the thing, that, would, that is where games could learn a lot from tech. Now you asked the reverse question, what could tech learn from games? Yeah. And like, that's a really interesting one for me. I think that the games sit in this place, they're distraction, they're distraction in a world. And I don't, I don't want to oversimplify that. Sorry, their hobby, their distraction, but they're like, it's, it's disposable time, disposable income that we're putting towards these things, right? This is not for survival that we play games. It is for thriving, right? It is for, is for that sort of thing. 
And so you compete with Netflix, you compete with sports leagues, you compete with, you know, movies, you compete with music, you're competing with all these things. And so you have this like very tough thing where you're trying to distract people away from all the other things they could engage with. And instead, you're trying to get them to like play your game and have a good time and engage with that experience and enjoy that and want to keep doing that. And what that leads to with the best games is this unbelievable focus on the audience experience, not as a, any sort of utilitarian thing, but like, how do I really make this something that you love to engage with? And by the way, Aaron loves to point this out too. Like you go into the mod scene, people would run through molasses to get to battle royales before PUBG and H1Z1 and all this stuff existed. Like we were just, we were just like playing the buggiest garbage, you know, that you could play because the core experience was there. And I think that's something where like, okay, what does that look like for tech, right? Are you being too utilitarian when you think about that audience? You're going like, well, I just need to make sure that everybody just like does, you know, it's, it's good enough. They can find the button. It's good to go. What does it mean to have that be something where it's like, no, and I'm not saying, you know, if I'm making an app that delivers food, they have to be like, oh, I just want them to spend all day in that app. But it's like, how do I make this something that they love to engage with for the 10, 15, 30 seconds that they're engaging with it? Instead of it being like something where it's kind of, oh, okay, I have to pick between the seven apps that do this and like they all kind of suck in their own way, right? How do you how do you step up in that? Games have to answer that question or they don't survive at all. And I feel like, and again, I, I say this as someone who hasn't spent a ton of time in the tech space, just, just like bits and pieces here and there. But I think that's something, that just obsession with the experience, the audience, the player in, in the case of games. You're hitting on something that I've been thinking about a lot lately because I feel like you... Aaron, when you were introducing yourself at the very top, you know, you, you alluded to the anonymity of sort of the old internet when it was, there wasn't sort of, you know, literal over-indexing of everything. And I think a lot of the process that we see unfolding in tech development today, it's so easy to be pixel perfect upfront that yeah. those, you know, fat marker sketches and, you know, really low fidelity wireframes, it, it's now just as easy to make something pixel perfect as it is to make the rough sketch 10 or 15 years ago. So now everything being pixel perfect has taken away some of that endearing roughness of the early internet where you see a calendar and it's not, you know, fully functional with daylight savings and multi time zone. And, you know, it's just a list of time slots and it's super low functionality, but it got the job done. And when, when we look at the internet, today and, and, and enterprise SaaS, wh whatever application you're thinking of, everything is so fit and finished and polished that there's no room for that exploratory, you know, it, it's not quite perfect, but it's adorable and you kind of love it mm -hmm. because of the imperfection. And I feel mm -hmm. like the, a lot of the products that we're seeing are, are so perfect that there's, there's, it's almost, there's no, none of that endearing quality. And I think that a lot of this has to do with risk aversion. Obviously, if you've got huge, large cap blue chip companies with tons of shareholders and earnings calls you need to worry about imperfection is not something that you're going to brag about or even strive for but i think there's yeah. something lost in that aspect of say, saying no to a bunch of good ideas to focus on one great one mm -hmm. and working on it and and not maybe getting it right the first time and and seeing what happens and having a little bit of a you know risk embracing and i think there's something in what you're talking about that's striking a chord and something I've been thinking about for a while and just getting something out there and, and being okay, testing it live and, mm -hmm. and seeing, seeing what happens. Yeah. And I feel like we're, we're afraid to do some of that anymore. Yeah. And, I, and it, I think in a way it's been satisfying for Ben and I to see that the people who are willing to do that and can do that very nimbly and cheaply are starting to take a significant chunk of the pie mm -hmm. in our industry. And I think that it's funny, there's a lot of like corporate types that are sort of like waxing philosophical about like, what does that mean? And can they ever do what we do? And I mean, like I, I've had discussions with people in, in at conferences where I've heard things like, well, without the marketing genius that we've built over the last 20 years, they'll never be able to be as successful as we. And you just hear this crap and it's like, no, it's like, you know, the Roblox kids are making like $30 million a year now. I just crazy. read a story like yesterday about like a new game that's game mode that's blowing up, which is like the crazy tennis thing. I don't, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. Like this stuff is like, I have trouble keeping up 
And it's like, so who's to say they won't be making a hundred million a year, three years from now, who's to say there won't be a new Roblox that has a better rev share model five years from now. Like, I don't know, you know, I mean, Epic's leaning into this, these companies are leaning into this because they're realizing that like a lot of other areas of media, the creator economy is actually generating a ton of value. And so I think that, you know, and it's interesting in our industry, we're almost being forced to reckon with that because even though I, I am of the belief that I think most sort of traditional corporate types in games are actually kind of like, well, no, we can't show it until it's ready. Like it has to be polished. It has to have this. It has to have that. And, and like Ben and I can argue with them, but like there's no better argument than, like I said, the PUBG that just emerges that no one expects and makes a billion dollars. Baldur's Gate 3 like, sitting on early access for f- yeah. like three or four years, right? Like, th- and, and then blowing yeah. up to be certainly one of the more successful games, if not the most successful game of the last several years. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to pull an analogy too, to what we just referenced, because I was thinking about this. I'm like, what's an example of what I'm talking about? And for me, a great one is like, you have Microsoft Teams, which you're, you're now be, you know, getting back more familiar with. You have Slack, right? And then you have Discord. And there's something I, I don't, I couldn't tell you what it is, right? Go talk to a UX designer or whatever, like someone like that. But Discord just blew Slack out of my mind when it showed up. It was just like, oh, wow, this does everything I want it to do. It seems really smooth. I don't seem like I have to fight with as much. And by the way, I'm not like knocking Slack. Slack is a great tool. Tons of people use it. It works really well. But there's something about Discord and the th- feel of it and the way the you know the different servers work and all those different things where i'm just like what a just i don't know what a refined experience that just like slowly inserted itself into my life and i'm an old bogey grumpy man who hates new things and like just just became more and more of like a part of how i communicate with first my friends then my family then communities of interest to me like how did this happen? And yet there it is, right? And see, and it's I, funny. It's funny because you you're like, well, I'm an old man. I I should be the one that doesn't get don't get this. But like the thing is, is like the gamer community was blazing trails in that department. You used TeamSpeak. Yes. Use exactly. Ventrilo. Use Roger Wilco if you want to go back far enough. Like, oh yeah. Those things are the predecessors to Discord. So like that product need it was a niche at that time, but that product need existed. And I think now you're seeing like our guilds are now becoming that that desire to commune is becoming a mainstream idea yep. now in the way people interface with the internet. And I think it just just like to me, Reddit is the god of all forums, right? But we were posting on forums for decades, like I'm sure you guys were back in the old days. Oh, yeah. Like and I, that was I loved being a forum troll. It was it was so fun. And like Reddit gives me a little taste of that if I want to go back from time to time, right? So but only on your alt account. Yeah, I'm gonna, exactly. I'm gonna, well, I don't, gonna, I don't post, so I'm safe. But <laughs> I'm going to wrap us up with just a, a couple closing questions. I could talk to you guys all day long. I've loved this conversation, but a couple questions that we ask all of our guests and I want to make sure I, I make time to, to hear what you guys think about these last couple. Super, super short and sweet. What does the word innovation mean to each of you? To me, it might be oversimplified, but to me, innovation means trying new things and seeing if they can positively change people's lives. I think for me, the, the, the phrase that's coming to mind is like applied creativity or useful creativity. Hmm. It's like you, you have to look at the world and you have to go, okay, I'm going to look at this in a different way, in a creative way, not just because that's fun in my own head, but because like I think there's actually something here that will change how something works for the better. Yeah, I, I that's like That's innovation. That. I like that. I, I don't think I've heard quite that take on it. Like, it's almost like the difference between art and innovation is that innovation is is almost like applied art. Yes. Art mm-hmm. is art for its own sake. And, and innovation yes. is when it becomes something useful, something meaningful and in a practical way. Yeah. I really like that. So y- y- I'm going to close with uh, a, a call to action to sh- share with everybody where they can find you, what's inspiring to you, what's, you know, y- you've got your own podcast, which I've already mentioned. You just launched a course. How can folks get in touch with you and and see other things that you're talking about and writing about? The best way to get involved with building better games, which by the way, if you're not in games, but you're just interested in games in an ancillary way, we break down into useful bits a lot of like the global production process. We're trying to compartmentalize into a digestible way the whole way games are made. That's kind of like one of our goals. So if you're interested in that, quickest way to get involved is just to 
load up the podcast or to sign up for the newsletter because that stuff's just free and it's just going to be coming to your inbox like every two weeks or whatever it is. And if, and then I think the rest will work itself out. So sign yeah. up for the newsletter um, and listen yeah. to the podcast. Buildingbettergames.gg, buildingbettergames.gg is where you can find us. There's a newsletter tab, a podcast tab, and we did just launch a course called Succeeding in Game Production, What You Weren't Taught. For product managers, I did have two product managers who are not actively in games right now go through the course, and they actually got a heck of a lot out of it. So while it is designed for game dev and game producers, if you're interested in some of that space or if you want to learn more about how I view leadership and how Aaron and I kind of think about producers fitting into organizations, a lot of it does apply. So you might get something out of it too. Well, as, as an avid reader of your content and listener of your show, I, I can I can personally attest that the content is always valuable whenever I see it. I really appreciate you both making time to join us today. It's been a blast talking to you again. It's It's been a privilege. So appreciate it. I, I look forward to what's in store for you guys. I, I know big things are to come. So cheers. Thank you. Cheers to yeah, you, sir. Great to be here. Re really appreciate it. Well, that's it for today. In line with our goals of transparency and listening, we really want to hear from you. Sean and I are committed to reading every piece of feedback that we get. So please leave a comment or a rating wherever you're listening to this podcast. Not only does it help us continue to improve, but it also helps the show climb up the rankings so that we can help other listeners move, touch, and inspire the world just like you're doing. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next episode. Mm -hmm.